Once again, Heavenly Father, as we open up our Bibles this morning, I want to thank you just for giving us your words, your instructions, your commands, your precepts. They're such a treasure to us. I thank you that behind every one of your commands is provision and protection. And Lord, I pray that this would be a time where your body is built up, it is exhorted, it is challenged, and it is strengthened that your kingdom may advance in this world. Once again, Holy Spirit, I come to you and I ask that you would fill me for the purpose of explaining the Word of God. May it be as if, well, may it be as if, again, you are present here, Jesus, and you were speaking directly to us. May it not be me, but may it be you. Teach us about your ways. Teach us about you. Draw us closer to you. And may you, as in all things, be glorified. Direct this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask that you get your Bibles out this morning. Sitting at home, get your Bibles out and turn to Isaiah chapter 58 as we continue our series, God's Chosen Fast. This morning's sermon is entitled Inside and Out, and I just want to begin with a story. Now, you know that we're coming up on four years living in the great state of Washington. Uh, we very much like it here as a family. Uh, and you've heard me joke that since our move to Washington, that our family averages about one car rear-end accident a year. True story, we have been in Washington coming up on four years, as I said earlier, uh, this August, it'll be four years, and Mark, Erica, uh, myself, and my son Jacob have all been rear-ended. Uh, now, the first time this happened, it was my son Mark, and he was driving our old 99 Ford Expedition. In fact, he, he, the accident was so bad that uh, the truck was completely totaled. So we needed to replace it. And so with the money that we got uh, from the insurance company for totaling it out, and a gift from a friend, uh, we went car shopping. That's not always fun to go car shopping, but we went car shopping. Uh, and uh, we didn't need a big vehicle anymore, especially a gas guzzling vehicle like a Ford Expedition. And my wife had a, a history she kind of grew up with through her, her mother, grew up with Ford Mustangs. And so we kind of began to think of those as a particular option for my wife. And so I found this beautiful red used Ford Mustang at this dealership in Pacific, Washington. And I was surprised at the price. So Eric and I test drove it. And this was a, a really sharp looking car. A beautiful red Mustang color. It had a, a new paint job, uh, new tires. Uh, it had a white racing strip that they were going to put on it. And so it was really sharp looking. The interior uh, for the age of the car was pretty clean and it drove nice. But when we looked under the hood, everything changed. The engine compartment had not been touched. I mean, it was filthy. There was just dirt and grease everywhere and it just was kind of the shock because the exterior was just so nice there was a air filter that I could see 
that was exposed and it was just dirty. And it was really kind of a disappointment because we were told that the air filter had been changed. Well, obviously it hadn't been changed. The spark plug wires, we could tell that they needed to be replaced. They were cracking. At this point, as we were talking to the salesman and looking at the engine, we began to wonder if the oil and filter had even been changed. We were disappointed to say the least. And standing there, looking at the grease and dirt that covered the engine compartment, two things became clear to us. Number one, we were not going to reward the dealership by purchasing this car. And number two, the inside did not match the outside. The inside, the engine compartment, it was just so filthy. It completely nullified the beautiful, pristine exterior. Now, giving attention to the exterior while ignoring the interior... That's not something that just happens in car dealerships. In fact, it is especially common in religion. Now, this is the conundrum, the confusing problem that the people of Israel face in Isaiah 58. Let's turn there. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 through 7. I'm going to read this verse out loud. But uh, we're going to look at this, these seven verses, verse by verse, and I'll explain what is going on so we can get a, a full, I hope this morning, a, a full knowledge or a, a good grasp of the problem that people are dealing with. Isaiah 58, verses 1 through 7. Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression. To the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. As if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast... You seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose? A day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast in a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh." Let's talk about the first part of this verse, this section of scripture called the people's chosen fast. Let's look at verse one. Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. As we look at this passage, we can see that the prophet is commanded by God to publicly declare to my people, to loudly cry aloud. Your voice like a trumpet into boldly, don't hold back, the Lord says, proclaim to the people their sins. So he's not to speak calmly. Isaiah is not to speak calmly. He is not to be quiet about their situation. Think of that phrase, that first verse, as this. They, the people, the prophet, is commanded to shout basically at the top of his voice to get everyone's attention. 
That's why the analogy of a blown trumpet is there. In ancient times, you blew a trumpet, it gathered people's attention. We do the same thing today. Get a speakerphone or a trumpet, it gets people's attention. But what sin did the people commit that brought such a strong response from the Lord? There is a sense as you read this passage that the people are blind to their condition. They're blind to their sins. And we will soon find out that is exactly the case. Verse 2. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Now, personally, I find these first two verses, but especially the second verse, troubling. It is unnerving to me. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Because look at the religious activity of the people. It says, they seek me daily. This is God speaking. They are seeking God daily, these people. They are very serious about their faith. You may recall my personal testimony when I was in college at Ohio University as a freshman through a series of, of unfortunate circumstances. My mouth got me in trouble. I was in a, a tent situation, got out of it, but that very night, the hand of the Holy Spirit was heavy upon my heart, and I realized that I need to make God a priority in my life. And I remember... Actually, it was the Holy Spirit bringing back to my remembrance what a former youth pastor of mine said while we were living in Texas. The more serious you get with God, the more serious God will get with you. Well, these people, they are very serious about God. They're very serious about their faith. They're seeking Him daily. Let me put this into perspective for us. This just came out uh, a few weeks ago. The latest research research shows that one out of five or 20 percent of people who attend an evangelical protestant church hold a biblical worldview now it's key to understand the phrase evangelical protestant church we're talking about conservative evangelicals people that would they don't just go to church maybe once a month they're you know fairly regularly attending church only 20% hold a biblical world worldview. That means that four out of five or 80% do not hold a biblical worldview. In other words, they don't view the world through biblical truth. Now we know that if you truly believe something, that your lifestyle typically reflects those beliefs. Belief always comes before behavior. But look at those numbers. If 80% of the people who attend an evangelical church, an evangelical Protestant church, by the way, 80%, and that would mean the majority of the people that are listening are viewing this, viewing other pastors throughout the country. They don't hold, those 80% don't hold a biblical worldview how often do you think that they seek God? How often do you go a day or two or maybe a week without spending time with God? This is not the case with the people that Isaiah is to confront. Think about that. God says they are seeking him daily. This is why, one of the reasons why, I find this so unnerving. It says that they delight to know my ways. God says they delight to know my ways. Their heart's desire, that's what it means, delight, desire, is to learn about God and his ways, his commands, his precepts. And I researched this a little bit. This was a typical 
week or a year as well, or a month, week, and a month and a year in the life of a Jewish person back at the time that Isaiah was speaking. Much of the Jewish religious observance is centered in the home. There would have been daily prayers, and they're said three times each day, in the morning, the afternoon, and after sunset. There were congregational prayers that took place in the synagogue, i.e. a church for us today. They would go on Mondays, they would go on Thursdays, they would go on the Sabbath, which for them would have been a Saturday. They also had festivals throughout the year and high holy days. And there the synagogue service would include readings in Hebrew from the Torah and the prophets. So these people are daily seeking God. I mean, their schedule is revolving around God. The people are asking God for righteous judgments. They're asking God for justice. In the eyes, in their eyes, they're not asking God for anything that is wrong or unfair, but rather what is right and unfair. They delight to draw near to God. That basically means they enjoy being in the presence of God. They enjoy being with him. And that's why they seek him daily. They're doing all of that, folks. And what does God say? Well, there's a problem. Verse 2. As if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. Notice the word if. They look like a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of God. But it is one thing to be like such a nation and another thing to be such a nation. How is it possible to desire God and his ways and yet forsake God's justice? Well, think of the Pharisees in the New Testament. They would tithe off their spices. What you have in your, your kitchen shelves and cabinets and so on, or on your shelves and in your cabinets, they would tithe the 10% off of all those spices. And yet they had no problem evicting a widow from her home because she couldn't pay her debts. It is possible to be so zealous for religious activities while missing the truth that these activities are meant to convey. I believe our Lord would say this, don't miss the irony here. People, you want righteous judgments. You want justice. You long to be near to me. If I gave you what you ask, if I came down to visit you, because of your sins, it would not be a pleasant experience. You would not enjoy my presence. And this is from a people that are seeking God daily, that desire him and his ways and desire to be in his presence. They're serious about their faith. Verse 3. This is a conundrum. This is a confusion. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? God is not responding to the denial of food. It's not grabbing God's attention. He's not acknowledging it at all. This is what humbling of one's soul is to do. This is what the people understood. There was no one in the history of Israel, according to the Bible, who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord more than King Ahab. That's exactly what it says. When he killed Naboth to take possession of Naboth's vineyard because it was right next to the king's vineyard, God sent Elijah the prophet to pronounce judgment upon Ahab. Now Ahab's response is found in 1 Kings 21, 27 through 29. I'm going to read it to you. And when Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about dejectedly. Now keep in mind, this is the most wicked king 
most evil king in all of Israel. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Have you seen, this is God speaking now, how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his days. But in his son's days, I will bring the disaster upon his house. His house, excuse me. So clearly, the people of God, they're not finding satisfaction in their denial of food, in their fasting, in the humbling of themselves, and neither is God. But they expected to find an answer to get what they wanted. They're doing exactly what Ahab did. And Ahab was wicked. They're not wicked, are they? They are pursuing God, but they're not getting an answer. The people see religious behavior as a means of getting something from God. Now that sounds like paganism. That's not biblical religion. Verse 3. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Verse 4. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Now God diagnoses their problem. He reveals their self-serving motives. They're fasting for selfish gain. They're pressing the workers. They want to win the fight. They want to win the argument. They're not fasting for their voice to be heard on high where God dwells. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. They're humbling themselves before God in their bodies, but they're not humbling themselves before God in their souls. I imagine the people, and if I were in their shoes, I would probably think the same thing. They're taken back by God's diagnosis. They might say or are probably thinking, I would never fast to practice oppression. But that is what the outcome would be because they're seeking their own desire. Practicing religious activity, that's not just fasting, it's all religious activity. But for the sake of this sermon series, even fasting, practicing fasting in an unbiblical manner, it always leads to religious pride. And pride, as we know, has a way to harden the heart and to blind us from reality. In this case, the people, watch this, they could not connect their mistreatment of the workers to the living out of their religious activities. There was a massive disconnect. Just look at the behavior that is accompanying their fasting. It says, you seek your own pleasure... Whatever that means, in, in some ways, other than eating food, they're seeking their pleasure. They drive hard all their workers. They become irritable and contentious, and they're stirring up strife. And it goes as far as fistfights. All the while, they're doing what? They're fasting. Now, verse 9 provides even more insight into their conflict. The pointing of the finger, it says, in speaking wickedness. Now, the pointing of the finger literally means the sending of the finger. Think about this. You know, I'm, while I'm smiling, the sending of the finger is probably the equivalent of giving someone the finger. This is what's going on. It doesn't simply mean they're pointing at someone as if they're trying to assign blame, saying, no, you're wrong. They're doing the... They're giving the finger. So God also tells them to stop that and to remove speaking wickedness. Most likely they were slandering one another. Let me translate that verse 9 for you. The point of the finger, the, the speaking wickedness. Don't gesture and speak in ways that show a callous contempt for others. 
This is what is going on while they're fasting. Now, God continues his diagnosis in verse 5. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast in a day acceptable to the Lord? God now asks two rhetorical questions in verse 5. The first one is this. Is this the fast that I choose? Now, the people already know the answer. It's no. The rhetorical question is followed by a list of the religious forms of their fasting. Now, pay attention to this list because you're going to see it mirrors what King Ahab did, a wicked king. There's the humbling or afflicting of oneself, which is the denial of food. They're bowing their head like a reed in submission and in, 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 in shame for their sin. They're spreading out sackcloth in ashes. That's exactly what Ahab did. Now this, folks, is alarming too. Because one can faithfully worship the exterior practice of religious disciplines like fasting while ignoring the inner life. Let me say that again. One can faithfully worship, and it's not just fasting again. It can be your giving. It can be your Bible study, your praying, your serving. All of worship, and including fasting, the exterior practice of religious disciplines, you can practice all of that and you ignore the inner life. The people in the time of Zechariah fasted regularly. They had the proper form down, the denial of food, they bowed the head in sackcloth and ashes. They did that for 70 years. And it profited them nothing because the inner life, the motive, was wrong. They weren't fasting to God. Again, they were fasting from a selfish motive. Dr. Henry Cloud was the clinical director of a Christian psychiatric hospital, which held a weekly meeting where other doctors, nurses, and therapists gave updates on their patients. And that weekly meeting was one of the highlights of the week for Dr. Cloud. It was a rich time, he says, of seeing and hearing of the goodness these professionals were bringing into the lives of those under their care. It was also a time of agonizing over the difficulties of some of their patients. When the time came to talk about Maddie, a heaviness filled the room. Maddie was a very difficult person to like. She had developed a way about her that was off-putting. It seemed that something was always wrong with others. in the world around her. You ever know someone like that? It's always someone else's fault. We all turned to Graham, her psychologist, when I asked him what was happening with Maddie. And this is what he said. Well, it seems that Maddie still has no interest in having an interior life. Let me say that again. It seems that Maddie still has no interest in having an interior life. And let's take this and apply it to the people in the time of Isaiah chapter 58. As long as these people refuse to examine their interior life, the attitudes that drive behavior, their lives are not going to change much. This is what God is trying to get them to do. Look Inside, examine the interior life. Now, to emphasize his point, God asks the same rhetorical question, only differently. You see that? Will you call this a fast? And the answer is the same. No. God's questions are demanding an examination of the heart motive for their fast. And it's an examination that leads only to one point, only to one conclusion. The inside does not match the outside. The exterior of the car looks great, but the engine, it's dirty. It's filthy. As a result, folks, 
These people are religious hypocrites. And our Lord's point is this. The real test of the authenticity of the fast is the lifestyle that accompanies it. Monday is the proof of Sunday. Monday is the proof of Sunday. That's the people's chosen fast. Now let's talk about God's chosen fast. Verse 6. Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Here is a fast that God chooses. It says, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. And it also says the same thing in verse 9. If you take away the yoke from your midst. Let me say this again and see if you can see a pattern here. Loose the bonds of wickedness. Undo the straps of the yoke. Let the oppressed go free. Break every yoke. Take away the yoke. What is the theme? The theme is freedom. In verses 6 and 9. Now, a little history lesson here. The people have been in captivity to Babylon. Babylonian captivity. They've now been set free. They've been exiled. And they're tasting freedom for the first time. The question is this. How are they using their freedom? Are they using it to liberate or to oppress people? Now, the Apostle Paul put it this way. You know, thousands of years later. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom, and you know this verse, as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. Jesus said it this way. Woe to you lawyers as well. For you weigh men down with burdens hard to bear. While you yourselves want to even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. And the point is clear. Live a life to free people, not burden them, not oppress them. And the people that were fasting were living a life in such a way, while fasting, by the way, that was oppressing the people, the workers, the poor, the hungry, the naked. Verse 7. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Now, I understand everything about verse 7 except the last phrase. Not to hide yourself from your own flesh. I mean, I understand sharing bread with the hungry, bringing the homeless poor into your house, clothing the naked, covering them up, and so on. But what does it mean to hide yourself from your own flesh? Well, I think this phrase, as I research this, not to hide yourself from your own flesh, means that God's call and, and the fast that he chooses, it's a call to be sympathetic. To feel what others feel because we have the same flesh as they do. Now, the thought may be the same as Hebrews 13.3. It says this. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who are ill-treated since you yourselves also are, also are in the body. So God is saying this. Put yourself in the place of the hungry, the homeless, the poor, these oppressed workers. Feel what they feel. Isn't that what you're supposed to do? I mean, we don't really do it. But isn't that what you're supposed to do in conflict management or conflict resolution? Get outside yourself and try and understand your other, the other person's or your enemy's perspective. Now, there are people who have an ability to empathize with others. I am not one of those people. It doesn't mean I don't have moments of sympathy. I can't empathize with people. It's just not something that is 
more as natural to me as it is to some people I know. But I've observed that there is a prerequisite for sympathy. And without it, you will never be able to enter into the experiences of others and feel what they feel. And that prerequisite is a softened heart. A softened heart. And in this case, God says that the people are so infected with the disease of religious hypocrisy that they're sick. It's blinded them. They can't see their true condition. It has also hardened their hearts. Again, they are so blind that they're fasting to God, seeking justice from Him while they're fighting, while they're giving people the finger. And there's just this massive inconsistency. The inside does not match the outside. And what we're beginning to see in this passage is that God's solution to their problem is what we would call an antidote. It's the exact opposite of what they're doing. You know how it goes. You, know, you get treated with, when you get poisoned, what are you treated with? What's well, the antidote? It's the exa exact opposite. So what's the answer to a hardened heart? Well, it's a softened heart. What's the answer to, to all the contention, all the strife? It is sympathy. Get outside yourself. Try and understand and feel what others are feeling. Now look back at verse 7. You find the words share, bring, cover, do not hide yourself. Do you see the theme of service to others there? Again, Galatians 5.13. Use your freedom as an opportunity to serve one another. The thought of fasting, this must have really blown the people away, for the sake of others, for their freedom, for their provision, it not only contrasts fasting from selfish motives that the people were engaging in, but that is the kind of fast that God sees from on high and hears from on high. Folks, what good is it to, to deny yourself food? Think of it this way. When others around you are hungry and you're doing nothing about it. That's the test. Now, all worship, and including fasting for our purposes in this series, should be accompanied by righteous living. Again, I say to you, Monday is the proof of Sunday. You've heard this phrase before. The unexamined life is not worth living. This phrase was uttered by Socrates at his trial for heresy. He was subsequently sentenced to death. This is what God is asking the people to do. Examine your motives. Don't just follow the form of religious activity, but examine why you are doing what you're doing. Does the inside match the outside? If not, what needs to change? Living out your freedom in the service of God and others has its rewards. What are the blessings of a fasting of God's choosing? Well, we'll look at that next week. Meanwhile, this is your application point. I want you to take some time this week. Examine your life. An unexamined life is not a life worth living. So examine your motives this week for your religious activity, for why you're reading your Bible, why you're praying, why you give, why you serve, whatever you do. Do it all in the Lord. What is your motive? Let's pray. Father, you're about the heart. We look at the exterior, you told David. But no, you, or you told Samuel, you look at the heart. You're about the interior. So much more than the exterior. 
And Lord, we want to come to you with a pure heart. When we fast, we want to fast with the right motives. And that is the point this morning. And so Holy Spirit, I ask that as you do in Psalm 139, as it says that you know us, you created us, and you know, show us, you say, the air of our ways. We love you, deepen our love, deepen our faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have a great Sunday. Enjoy the weather. God bless you.